see. That's today. All right. Sorry for running a, a few minutes late, but uh, last time it was traffic. This time it was me just running late. So <laughs> no real excuses other than that. Okay. So let, let's take care of some housekeeping. So today, um, uh, well, first off, let, let's talk about homework. So you all have a homework due on Thursday, okay? I don't have it on the agenda, but I'm, I'm going to start the class off with it. But um, uh, today you have, uh, or you, you have a homework due on Thursday, and then I have assigned homework five, which is uh, homework on beam stresses, which is going to be due the following Thursday. After today, you should be able to handle just about all of it. Um, the, the last problem on shear stresses might be, uh, you, you won't probably won't be able to handle that, but we should be able to dis we should be discussing that on uh, on Thursday. So uh, and then in terms of uh, housekeeping, <coughs> we're going to have our exam review uh, on that Thursday, the exam two review, and then unless you know a blizzard happens or something, uh, we're having our second exam on on uh, October 30th. So that is two weeks from today. Okay. Um, and I'll be on time that day. <laughs> I'll, I'll sure, be sure and be here early. Um, any questions on housekeeping, on uh, you know business up until now? I will say this: the other day I went on and uh, and I updated everybody's attendance grades. So because with the, the the baby and whatnot, I hadn't had time to actually go through and you know put that in uh, on Blackboard. Well, that's uploaded. That's there. So everybody's attendance grade, obviously, other than today, uh, is up to date. So, um, sound good on housekeeping? All right. You all do have, uh, this is what I was going to say, I don't have this on the agenda. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, uh, add it here uh, later. But um, homework four, it's due on Thursday. Um, do you all have any questions about it? Uh, any, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it on Excel. I have no problem with that at all. Just print it off. <clears throat> I'm not worried about it. Because, because there's so many of them that if you have one value off, it's little, little, you know, small potatoes. I'm really not worried about it. Um, but, I, I mean, I, let me say this. I don't want one Excel sheet printed off 15 times for everybody in the class. <laughs> so work on it on your own. But, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Um, any other questions about the homework? Y'all are about done with it, right? <laughs> I know things. All right, but yeah, it's due Thursday, um, and you are, you have homework five up there now, and that's not due till the following Thursday. But there's going to be some uh, uh, common stuff, or at least the bending stress stuff uh, that we've talked about up until now. Sound good? Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to uh, continue our discussion of bending stresses. I have one more example that I want to get through with you. And then we're going to handle a topic on the side of uh, bending stresses, and that is composite bending. How do you handle um, uh, elements that are being bent that are comprised of more than one material behaving compositely? Um, and, and I would say this, if there's any... Let me say, uh, I'm going to choose my words carefully. Composite bending is uh, uh, applicable to both civil, uh, civil engineers and mechanical engineers. I'm not saying you all don't need to know it. But I can tell you as a civil engineer, it is particularly important for us because um, we deal with composite uh, st uh, structures and composite bending all the time. Okay. <coughs> Let me just sort of shut up for a little bit on, on the background and get into it. So last time we left off with this, we did... Uh, this uh, I-beam exam, or this I-beam, it's a, a wooden joist example, and we, we took the moments from example 18 and example 19, and we said, well, if those beams were made using a wooden joist that's three inches wide and ten inches tall, well, what's going on? Is, is the beam going to behave satisfactorily? And so that's where sigma equals my over i came into play uh, and what have you. And we found that in some scenarios it's good, in some scenarios it's not. But we also discussed member orientation, okay? And I wish I'd had this last time, but I figure I'll, I'll bring it this time. This is sort of this uh, uh, fl uh, flexible I-beam prop that, that I used uh, in class here and there. And actually, I think that it uh, illustrates 
the idea of strong axis versus weak axis really, really well. Okay, so I have an I-beam, and if you take this I-beam and you bend it, you know, across its strong axis, so like bend it about the Y, or about the I shape, versus bending it like this, you can feel that it is much more flexible or it's much more weaker when it's being bent this way. And this is its weak axis, whereas this is its, this is its strong axis. Another thing that you'll notice is if you try and bend it this way, after a while it gets kind of wobbly. That's because it wants to buckle. So, and there's a specific name for that type of buckling. It's called lateral torsional buckling. For those of you civils who decide to take steel design one day, we talk about LTB uh, quite a bit in there. We'll pass that around. Y'all can have fun with that. Just, just do not hit the classmate next to you with it in an aggressive fashion. So, you know, I, I, I want tenure, so no lawsuits. It's 8 o'clock, but I'm going to get some laughs out of you, I promise. Okay, <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to do another bending stress um, uh, example, but instead of computing section properties, I want to use section properties that are available uh, uh, to us via design guides uh, and whatnot. Now, so I have a bending moment that's 10 foot kips, and I'm going to apply it to the following sections, okay? Now I've got a, a, channel, a, a channel that's going to be bent about the strong axis and the weak axis, and I've got a W shape that's going to be bent out of the, uh, uh, about the strong axis and the weak axis. Now I'll go ahead and tell you the one that's going to give us the most headache is actually this last one, this last one right here, the C15 by 50 that's bent about uh, its weak axis. Remember, from a terminology standpoint, I saw what you were doing there. <laughs> um, uh, remember, from a terminology standpoint, for instance, the C15 by 50. The 15 represents about how deep it is. It's, it, you know, from top to bottom what that measurement is. Uh, and the 50 is how heavy it is. So a C15 by 50 is a channel, a C shape, that is uh, about 15 inches deep and it weighs 50 pounds per foot. Okay? Now, um, let me go back to, or go back, let me pull something up here real quick. Uh, where's it? Exam or appendix F. Here, while that's loading, let me load up my calcs. There we go. Okay. So this is appendix F out of your textbook. I think I have uh, an older version of your textbooks, uh, textbook here, but I think it's still appendix F and the data is still the same. Now, <clears throat> what I have here is a, uh, uh, an eye shape. and I, uh, So we've got the table here looking at, at wide flange sections. Uh, if you look over here on the top right, okay, this image over here on the top right might just seem like a little pretty picture, but it's actually really important because if you notice, um, we have sort of a coordinate system drawn. Now, where is the origin of that coordinate system drawn for that, that shape? Like, what would you call this point right here for this eye shape? Like, what is that point right there? It's the centroid, okay? So all of these values that you see here uh, related to these axes are centroidal values. So a centroidal moment of inertia, a centroidal section module, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of important, okay? <laughs> now, we have uh, axis one and axis two. So if you want to think about it as x-axis or y-axis, that's fine. But really, I want you to think about it in terms of strong axis versus weak axis. Everybody in here that messed around with this saw that it was a little bit more difficult to bend this this way than it was this way. It's a lot more flexible this way, right? That's because it, it has a lower moment of inertia about this axis as opposed to about this axis. It's a lot stiffer uh, in this direction. And that's re uh, represented by the, uh, the moments of inertia. Now, if I look at what, what's our shape, what are we looking at? Uh, it's a W14 by 53, okay? W14 by 53. So scroll down a little bit. There we go. That's perfect because I can see, I can see the, the headers. Okay, so I've got the W14 by 53 right here. It's the second one uh, from the bottom here on the screen. <coughs> so I know it weighs 53 pounds per foot. The area is 15.6. So remember the area, that's the area of this eye shape. Like how big is that in square inches? That's 15.6. Uh, and I have all these uh, appropriate values. <coughs> now, we have a moment of inertia about the strong axis of what? 541 inches to the fourth and about the weak axis of, what is that, 57.7? Does everybody see that? Okay, now, the big thing to keep in mind is uh, this is symmetric about the x-axis and the y-axis. 
So remember, let, let me go back to my uh, my calculations here. Or here, let, let, let's let's just write down some values to sort of get the uh, the example started. All right, so. Let me move this over here. Element was, what was it, 10 foot kips? Right? Now, for this example, uh, you know, we have a bending moment of 10 foot kips, but we've been expressing stresses in like PSI or KSI, in other words, inches. So I'm going to convert this to inches. How, if I have 10 foot kips, how many inch kips is that? 120. Okay, you multiply. All right, think. It's 10 feet is 120 inches. Well, 10 feet kips is 120 inch kips. It's, it's the same, same concept. All right. <coughs> now, let's look, at, let's look at this W14 by 53. All right, so here's the, the, the table. So I have a moment of inertia of 541 inches to the fourth. I'm also going to write down the section modulus. So I have a section modulus of 77.8. Uh, I have a moment of inertia about the weak axis of 57.7, and the section modulus is 14.3. Everybody see that? Okay, all right. So this is, we'll call this I11, so that is 541, and then S11 is 77.8, and then I22 is 57.7. And then S22 is 14.3. Uh, remember your units. Moments of inertia are in inches to the fourth, but section moduli are in inches to the third. Or, or, and, and the metric equivalent as well. It's either like millimeters to the fourth and millimeters to the third or, 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 or what have you. Okay. And just so we're aware from a terminology standpoint, that's our strong axis, and that's our weak axis. Okay, now, another thing to keep in mind is this, that our maximum bending stress is, you know, MY over I, or I'm going to call this MC over I. Remember, C is that extreme fiber distance from the centroid to either the way tippy-tippy top of the beam or the very, 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 very bottom of the beam. But another way that you can write that is M over S, where S is the section modulus. And just to show you how this works, okay, just to show you how this works, I want to get one more value off this table, and that is the depth. Okay. Now remember, if you have a W14 by 53, it should be about 14 inches deep. And that's what our depth is. Our depth is 13.9. So, so whenever you look at it, it's going to be close to that. So our depth is 13.9 inches. Okay. Now for this first stress, I'm actually going to use both formulas just to give you kind of an idea how it works. And then from here on out, we're going to use the simplest formulas uh, that we can. Okay. So, let's look at part A. Okay. Part A for this problem says, here, let me sort of make this a little smaller. See. That's good enough. Okay. Part A says we need to determine what would be the resulting stresses on the top and the bottom of this cross-section if the, they were subjected to a bending moment of 10 foot kips? Now, for the W14 by 53, I propose that since it is symmetric about either this axis or this axis, that whatever stress I get on the top is going to equal whatever stress I get on the bottom. Sound good? So I don't need to worry about calculating them separately. They're just going to numerically be the same value. Okay? 
Now for the, for the W14 by 53 bent about the strong axis, I propose that there's two ways I can compute that. Okay? The first way of computing it would be to say this. I could say that the stress on the top is going to equal the stress on the bottom. Now, an easy way of computing it would just be to take M over S, in this case S11 over the strong axis. So I've got 120 foot kips, or no, 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 inch kips, divided by, what is that, 77.8 inches to the third, and that equals what? Say it again. 1.54, and what would be the units? KSI, there we go. That's exactly right. Unless I'm wrong, do I have a second on that? There we go, I saw somebody shake their head. Okay, now, that is the simple way of going about this by just utilizing the section modules, okay? What if you don't have a section modules? What if all you have is a moment of inertia? Well, another way of doing that is to use the moment of, er, moment of inertia as follows. Okay, so here's another way of doing it. We could say sigma top equals sigma bottom, which is MC over I. So how does that work? Well, on the bottom, we have 541 inches to the fourth. On the top, we have 120 inch kips. And then, now let's talk about C. All right, remember, what is C? Okay, we're here's our I beam, and we're talking about bending it this way. Okay, so C is the distance from the centroid. So the centroid is about right there, and it's the distance from the centroid all the way to either the very, very bottom or the very, very top. So what is that distance? It's D over 2, right? So let's see what happens if we plug in D over 2. So we have 1 half of D, which is 13.9 inches. And what do you get when you do this? you get 1.54 KSI. Okay, so I want you to understand what the S values are. What is the section modulus? It is a section property that is computed solely to make bending stress computations easier. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, another thing, let's also talk about this from a design standpoint. Remember, what does our bending stress profile look like? Okay, and I'm just going to sort of do this off to the side, but what does our bending stress profile look like? Here, let me move this over. We have, you know, some, some cross section. Here's where, let's say, where the centroid is, and then our bending stress profile looks something like that, right? Remember? So we have zero bending stress at the centroid, and then we get larger and larger bending stresses as we get away from it, right? So if here's my I beam, and I'm bending it, doesn't really matter which way I'm bending it, if I bend it like this, what I'm saying is this, along the center, along that middle line, here, let's do it like this, along this middle line right here, there's no bending stress at all. Above that line, it's in compression, below that line, it's in tension, right? The farther you get away from the centroid, the greater the bending stresses are. What I'm getting at is that as an engineer, let's go back to torsion. Where do you need to check stresses if you have a circular shaft subjected to torsion? Where do you check them? The outer edge, the, 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 the extreme fiber. You, know, you don't need to check stresses in the middle of it because you know there are none. It's, if the stresses on the outer wall are fine, then the whole shaft's fine, right? Well, it's sort of the same thing with beams. If, you have, if your stresses are fine on the top and bottom, then they're fine everywhere else. If it's symmetric, you only have to check one of them. But if your centroid is shifted up or down a little bit, well, then you need to figure out what's going on with both. Sound good? So I just want to make sure that we all have a general sort of understanding as to what's going on. Sound good? 
Now, let me ask you this, okay? If that first part was to determine bending stresses about the strong axis, you tell me how do you determine bending stresses about the weak axis? Tell me what to do. You tell me. It's not a trick question. It's, it's there you go. This is exactly right. Just, you're just dividing by S22. It's that simple. So, but what I, the big thing I want you to understand is what these values mean. So the S11 is bending it this way. The S22 is bending it that way. So when we compute our stress values for S22, think if you put the same amount of oomph on the beam this way versus this way, you're going to get more flex this way, so the stresses should be higher. So, so let's see if that happens. All right, so for part B, again, sigma top is sigma bottom is M over S22. And that is, what, 14.3? And so what does that come out to be? Say it again. 8.39. Do I have a second on that? Okay, good. Now, I'm just curious. If We're not going to do it, but if we wanted to use um, sigma equals mc over i, what would our c distance be if we were bending it like this? Somebody back here. What, what would my c distance be? This way, it was half the depth. What would it be this way? Go ahead. Well, this distance, right? Remember, when you have an I-beam, these parts, this part here and here, this is the flange. This part in the middle, that's the web. So basically, what you'd be looking up is, here's our table. We would want this. Here's our flange width. So for the 14 by 53, it's like 8.06. So the C value would be half that, so 4.03. Does, does that make sense? So again, so th th remember, uh, on an I-beam, those are your flanges there and there, and this center part, that's your web, okay? Sound good? All right. Now, let's look at the channel, okay? So our channel that we have to look up for this problem is a C15 by 50, okay? So, let me sort of do this. Let me strike a line. Let's look up our C 15 by 50. All right. Now, let's go to our table. Let's see. So here's the wide flanges. Here's the wide flanges. Here's the S shape. So just so you're aware, there's a like we, a lot of y'all probably would call these I-beams. There's actually a few different I-beams, so there's a few different ones. Okay, now, here's our channels, okay? Now, let's sort of take a step back, okay? First off, okay, we have the strong axis and the weak axis, okay? Now, this is termed the same as it was in, in the previous table, right? Our 1-1 one, one axis, that's the strong axis, and our 2-2 two, two axis, that's the weak axis, okay? Let me ask you a question. It, are these C shapes, are they symmetric about their strong axis? About the 1-1 one, one axis? Are they symmetric about the 1-1 one, one axis? Yeah, they are. So my point is, would you agree that the stress on the top and bottom, if it's been about this axis, are the same? Yes, that, that's, that's easy. Okay. Is that going to be the case for the weak axis? No. So I propose that you're going to get a different bending stress on the top than you are at the bottom. Okay. So we're not going to be able to use the section modulus really. It's really, we're going to have to be pretty careful with that. Okay. And, and whenever you're in doubt, the easiest way to get around that doubt is to not use a section modulus at all and just use MC over I. So that's what we're going to do, but we're going to be real careful about how we do that. Okay? So let's write down a, a few values that we're going to need. So let's start off with the 1-1 one, one axis, the strong axis. Do we really need the moment of inertia? 
I mean, do we really need it, or can we just use that for, for the 1, 1 axis? We can just use that because it's symmetric, right? So I propose there's really no point in even writing down the 404, okay? So I propose that all we need for the, uh, the 1, 1 axis is S11, and that is 53.8. Inches to the third. Okay. Now for the two two axis, we're going to need more. Okay. So at the very least, I know for the two two axis, we're going to need the moment of inertia, which is 11 inches to the fourth. So that's that's me getting that value right there. Okay. Now. I think it's probably a good idea to get this C value, right? I mean, how, how, what do we need? We need distances from the uh, from this uh, uh, centroid to either the way, 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 very, very left or the way, very, very, very right, right? So I think this C value is going to be pretty necessary, and that's 0.799. So that we're going to need this one. Are there any other values in this table that you think will probably help us out? Anything else that you think we'll need? Let me ask you this. From the centroid to the very, very outer left edge is this distance C, right? How about from the centroid to this very, very, very rightmost edge? How do we calculate that? No, no, no. This isn't symmetric. It, it's no, it, so you're thinking it's, it looks like it's halfway over. I propose it's not. There we go. We need the flange width minus C. What is the flange width? 3.72. The scale, the scale looks a lot, but you got to understand that one image is representing all the channels in the, uh, uh, in the table. So what we're going to need then is this value. So to give you kind of an idea for this, for this channel, if this is 0 0.799 inches, this distance is 3.72 minus 0 0.799 inches. Make sense? So we're going to have different bending stresses on the top and the bottom. Don't worry, I'm going to redraw all of this so you don't have to worry about copying this part down. I'm going to redraw all this. So we're going to need the flange width or we're going to need C, which is 0 0.799 inches, and we're going to need the flange width, which is 3.72. All right. So first off, part C is easy. Part C is to determine the strong axis stress, which is sigma top, sigma bottom, which is M over S11, which is 120 inch kips over 53.8 cubic inches, and that comes out to what? Two point two three. Do I have a second on that? All right, cool. All right, so that's 2.23, and what are the units? 2.23 KSI. Okay. Now, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Now, now, let me, let, and I'm going to give you an addendum to that answer here in a second. You can't, and I'll, I'll sort of give you a short answer. You can use it when it's non-symmetric, but you're not going to have the same S value. You're going to have different S values for the top than you are for the bottom. And, and I'm going to clear that up actually like right now. Okay. All right. Now, that's if that channel is being bent about the strong axis. If it's being bent about the weak axis, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that channel and I'm going to sort of turn it over like this. So let's say that we're bending it about its weak axis.
okay? So here's the channel, and the weak axis goes something about like that. So this is two, and this is two. So that's, that's sort of my, my centroidal axis, okay? So let's sort of look at what the bending stress profile would look like. So here's sort of the... Here's the bending stress profile over here. And I propose what this looks is going to look like in the end is this. Okay? Now now help me out with something. What is that dimension? Anybody remember what that dimension is? That's C. So this is 0 0.799 inches, right? And this dimension here is what? The, the flange width minus that. So can you give, somebody give me a number. Like what is that going to be? 3.72 minus 0 0.799. 2.99. 2 or 2.921. Okay, okay, all right. So here's what I'm getting at. You agree that this distance is longer, right? You also agree that the stress is zero at the centroid and it's linear out from that, right? So I propose that my bending stress profile is going to look like this. So it's going to go out, then it's going to go out, then it's going to go like that. Something like that. So where are we going to get higher stresses? On the top or the bottom? On the bottom, right? It's linear, right? If it's zero at the centroid and it goes out, it's got farther to go. So you're going to have higher stresses on the bottom. So if you were the engineer evaluating this channel, the only place that you have to evaluate it is right here. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now let's use MC over I to get, get our answers. Now remember, up, up until now we've had that the stress on the top equals the stress on the bottom. That's not the case here. For the stress on the top, We have MC for the top over I, which is what? So it's this is this is that. So what does that come out to be? Eight point, so we'll say 8.72. Do I have a second on that? Okay, so this is 8.72. And then for sigma for the bottom, we have MC for the bottom over I. I'm oh, sorry, I have I11. That's wrong. That's I22. Oh, sorry, I need to actually plug in the values. And so what does this come out to be? Thirty one. 0.87 KSI. Everybody okay with that? So that's a lot of stress on that little flange tip, right? A lot of stress. Sound good? Okay. Now, going back to, to, to your question about can you use M over S, you can use M over S, but it's, you got to be careful as to which S value you're using. Here, here's what I mean by that. All right, I'm going to sort of squish this over here on the, on the bottom. All right? There's going, because you have different bending stress values for the top and the bottom, you're going to have a different S value for the top and the bottom. Okay? The S value for the top is going to be I 
divided by C for the top. So that's 11 inches to the fourth divided by 0 0.799, and that's what? Thirteen point seven seven cubic inches. Do I have a second on that? Oh, cubic inches. Second on that? Okay. Now, S for the bottom is going to be I22 divided by C for the bottom. So that's 11.0 inches to the fourth divided by 2.0. 921. And so what does that come out to be? All right. Do I have a second on that? Now, so to go back to your question, yes, you can use M over S, but it's not going to be the same S. You're going to have a different S for the top as you are for the bottom. One other thing that's kind of nifty, when you look at the table, the table did give you an S value, okay? Which S value did it give you? It gave you that. It gave you the 3.77. Why did it give you the 3.77? This is the two axis. There's two values. Why did it only give you one of them? It gave you the worst case scenario, right? If you needed to know the stress at the top for some reason, if you're just curious or if it's, you know, you're, you're feeling rather celebratory, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, then, then, you would <laughs> then you would have to compute it, okay? And you would need to either do one of two things. You either need to break out sigma equals mc over i and have your appropriate c shape uh, or c value, or you would need to compute a, a, a section modules, and you'd still need to have the right c value. Now, did that, I know I went around by way, but that probably answered your question a little more completely. So, everybody else okay with that? Go back to, here, hold on, let me, right here? Which, no, are you talking about the stress or the section modulus? But I know, but are you talking about, are you talking about this, like these, or these? The stresses. The stress. So no, let, let's, let's be clear on terminology. On, on the top, like we were computing stresses here. This is the section modulus, so. The distances. That, 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 that's one way of looking at it as well. Exactly right. Yes, that's exactly right. If you're assuming linear behavior, yes, that will always be true. That will always be true. Um, one, one sort of advanced note I will say is some of you might be thinking, well, why the hell would we care about computing this if we know that this is going to be larger? It depends on your direction. Remember, Things in tension and things in compression don't always behave the same way. We haven't addressed that yet in this course. We'll do that probably near November, December time frame. But things in compression tend to like to do this thing called buckling. And so sometimes in certain design scenarios, you actually need to know what the stress and compression is and what the stress and tension is separately because they're going to have different limits. And so that we're not there yet. We'll talk about that later. But it is something to think about. Like I don't want you to uh, go, well, there's no point in computing it. Right now, I guess you could say there isn't a point, but that'll become a topic of discussion later. Sound good? All right. Yes, yes. And, and more often than not, we're going to assume linear behavior. When, when you assume linear behavior, what tends to happen is your stresses are larger than what they normally would be. So if you assume a linear behavior and it actually does taper off a bit, then your actual stresses are lower than what you're assuming. But that usually means your design is a little conservative. So that's that's okay. So that's actually that's a good thing. That means that people don't die. So I don't think we want that to happen. So sound good? All right. Now 
everything that we've talked about just now, uh, up until now is, is perfectly fine. And, and I would say that up until now, this is probably one of the most uh, fundamental skills that you all need to be able to have, not just in this course, but as engineers, and that is determining stresses and sections that are being bent. Um, but everything up until now, um, we've been dealing with beams that are made of a single material. Okay. Um, what about if you have a beam that is made of multiple materials, okay? Which is very, very common in the world of engineering. Um, for, those, for those of you civil engineers who are planning on taking reinforced concrete design, what do you think a reinforced concrete beam is? It's a concrete beam with steel in it. Like, that's a beam of two materials. I have another sort of niftier example to show you, and that's uh, in the world of timber design. I, I, I just think this is really cool and it, it helps enforce the theory a bit. Um, uh, see if I can find a good image of one. Here we go. Okay, how many of you have ever been in like a, a ski lodge or a church or a, you know, some sort of like large wood structure and seen wooden beams that look like this? How many of you have seen this before? Okay, this is what's called a glue lamb beam. It's sort of shorthand for glued or laminated uh, beam. And so the way that they, they manufacture these beams is they take layers of wood and they just stack them on top of one another. And, 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 and they're, we call, another term for it is engineering, engineered wood because they tend to be manufactured, like they're manufactured in sort of like a factory setting. Like they control the moisture and the humidity and, and all of that in order to generate these structures. And because it's wood, you can even get some really cool elements because you can get some curved uh, elements. And, and it's, it's a really cool science. Like timber design is... Is a really uh, it's a really interesting science. Um, one of the things though that's kind of interesting from a, 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 a an engineering standpoint is when you fabricate a glue lamb beam, you've got I mean, you could have dozens and dozens of layers of different species of wood from the top to the bottom. And as the engineer, typically what you do, and I'll just sort of use this term because I think it'll illustrate it easily. Typically what you do is you tend to throw the crappier wood in the center of the beam, but your really, really high grade uh, uh, species of wood on the top and bottom of the beam. Remember how your bending stress profile works, right? The centroid experiences zero stress and your highest stresses are on the top and the bottom. So put your really, really prime species of lumber on the top and bottom of the beam because they're going to be experiencing the larger stresses. The center doesn't really matter. So a lot of times when you see glue laminated structures, you'll see these striations of, of, of uh, uh, layer profiles. You'll say, okay, we'll have you know this species of wood on the top and then sort of this you know generic species of wood in the middle and then this species on the bottom. And so that's a that's a very common practice uh, in glue lamb uh, timber design. Well, that's that's an example just like a, 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 a reinforced concrete beam. We place steel in, in, a, in a concrete beam in order to reinforce it, but you have a beam of two materials. That actually presents a little bit of a problem for us as uh, engineering analysts because this formula, sigma equals my over i or mc over i, I mean the, the theory in and of itself, the, the bending stress theory, assumes that you only have a beam of one material. Okay. Well, how do you use that formula, how do you use this theory if you have a composite beam? if you have a beam made of multiple materials, okay? Well, the answer is we basically turn that into a beam of one material. We call it transforming the beam. We transform the beam into a beam of one material, okay? So let me give you kind of an example just to, this is just conceptual to give you kind of an idea of what's going on, okay? Let's say that I have a wooden beam and it is being uh, reinforced by steel plates, okay? We'll assume that the plates are attached so that it acts as a composite unit. Now, that might seem like a tough idea to understand, but, but I want you to think about it like this, okay? Now, can I borrow your netbook real quick? I just want to use this as an example. Oh, you lost your place, or do you know where your place is? Okay, you're good. <laughs> All right, okay, so here's the, uh, here's the notebook, and I'm going to bend it, okay? Now, here's what I propose that I'm doing. This is a beam, or this is not a single beam. This is about... 200 beams. Each sheet of paper is acting as its own beam, so they're acting independently. Okay, so it's not very difficult to flex. 
Now, let's say I, I wanted to play a, a, a prank on, on Mr. Walker, and I took some, a lot of time and some glue, and I glued every single sheet of paper together, okay? He's not going to like me very much. But, but I want you to conceptualize in your head, what's that going to do to the notebook? Is it going to be easy to bend? Now, it's going to be tough, right? It's going to be like bending like a big block of wood because it kind of is a block of wood. It's paper, you know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but thank you. But, but that, that's exactly what's going on. If you glue all of those pieces of paper together, what's happening is you're not bending 200 individual sheets of paper. You're bending one composite unit of a, it's almost like a single sheet of paper that's that thick, and it's a lot more difficult. That makes sense? That concept is composite action. Now, the assumption that we make mathematically to, to reflect composite action is this. When we bend that beam, we assume that the strain is constant. Okay, so remember, what does a strain profile look like? It's zero at the centroid and it's linear up and down. To take the example of the notebook, if I were to look at the strain profile of that notebook, if the sheets were not glued together, what it would look like is this. Here's the profile, and then I have you know, a strain profile for this page, and a strain profile for this page, and a strain profile for this page. And each page would have its own sort of independent strain profile, you know, and it would be really, really tiny. Assuming composite action, I'm saying I've got a, 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 a single strain profile uh, uh, across the board. In other words, that right there between those pages, they deform at the same rate. Same thing here. If I have this wooden beam attached compositely to these steel plates, I'm assuming right at the point where, where they meet that they deform the same amount so that the strain is the same, okay? Now, how do you, uh, how do you compute strain based on Hooke's law? Well, stress equals E times the strain, right? So the stress in the wood is going to equal the Young's modulus of the wood times whatever the strain in the wood is. The stress in the steel is going to equal whatever Young's modulus is for steel times whatever the strain in the steel is, right? Well, right there at that particular point where they meet, I propose that the strains are equal, that it's the same strain. So if that's and that is the same value, what I can do is this. Like, let's take this expression. Let's like th take that expression. Well, I could say that sigma wood divided by E wood equals some value for strain. And then for this one, the strain in the steel divided by E for the steel equals some value of the strain. And since the strains are equal, that's how I get that. So is everybody okay how I got that? Like, I, uh, I hope it's not like too much magic. It's pretty simple, right? Everybody okay with that? Okay, you mean leave it up here for a second? I see a couple people writing it down. I can wait for a little bit. Sound good? All right. Now, Let's look at the steel plates, okay? Um, what I have here is if we assume that the plates are relatively thin, we can express the force in the plates as, as follows. We can just take the, uh, the, uh, the stress times the area, so that's E times the strain times the area. Now, now what I'm doing for this, uh, this derivation is I'm assuming that the plates are really, really thin, okay? What I mean by that is, remember, your strain and your stress profile, they increase as you get farther away from the centroid. Well, if the plates were really, really thick, then you'd have a different stress on the bottom of the plate than you would on the top, and you'd have to integrate. This derivation will work regardless of the plate thickness. I just figure I've thrown enough calculus at you, and, and I think you're good. So I, we can we can if you want. Uh, that, no, okay, there we go. They're like, oh, we're good, we're good. So the only reason for assuming the thin plates is so that we don't have to integrate. So I propose that the force in that steel plate is EA times the strain. Well, here's what we're going to do. Watch this. I'm going to take these 
plates, these steel plates, and I'm going to replace them with what I'm going to call equivalent wood plates. Okay? In other words, I'm going to transform that steel into a little bit of wood. Okay? So in, if I do that, then I have to meet equilibrium. The force in that plate has got to equal the force in that plate. Okay? So I propose that the, for, the P in the steel has to equal the P in this equivalent wooden plate. So that was EA of the steel uh, times that value of, uh, of strain. And then what I'm going to do is set those plates equal and solve. And what ends up happening is what's in this box right here is, is what's uh, valuable. See, what my goal is in this derivation is this. I have this steel plate and I want to transform it into an equivalent wood plate. So first off, you notice that like here's the steel plate and transforming it into an equivalent wood plate, the plate got bigger. Okay? And I think that kind of makes sense if, if you think about it. Think about it like this. If I have a steel plate that's like two inches by a half inch and I want to get the same thing out of wood, well I need a lot more wood uh, uh, to, to make up for that. Steel is a whole heck of a lot stronger than wood, right? So if I have two inches of steel, well, I might need like 20 inches of wood. Make sense? Because just it, it doesn't do as much good. Okay. So how do I determine the area of that wood? Well, I, uh, you know, that, that transformed wood section. Well, I propose I take the area of steel and I modify it by a, an appropriate value. That value, after you plug and chug and reduce, is this. This is called the modular ratio. It's the ratio of the modulus of elasticity of steel to the modulus of elasticity of wood. We sometimes call this value n. Okay? Now usually n is expressed as the larger E value over the smaller E value. So when you compute E value or when you compute n values, they tend to be larger than one. Like it's a modular ratio of 6 or a modular ratio of 10. For you folks in reinforced concrete design, a modular ratio next semester, a modular ratio that we'll use a lot in there is 8 because the modulus of elasticity of steel being 29,000 KSI, if you compare that to a typical modulus of elasticity of concrete, it, you end up getting about 8 for your modular ratio. So that's a very common value between those two. All right? Everybody okay with this? Now, um, so, so the idea is the only thing you got to watch out for is when you compute stresses. When you compute stresses, you have to sort of make sure that you're reincorporating that, uh, that modular ratio appropriately. Remember, the strains, when we make this, when, when we do this derivation, we assume that the strains are equal. It doesn't necessarily mean that the stresses are equal. In fact, they're not equal. They're not equal by a factor of n, by a factor of this, this modular ratio. Don't worry when we go through and uh, do an example and, and, and derive this stuff. I think you'll see that this is, uh, that this is, this is pretty straightforward. Um, one other thing I want to point out is this. Here was our original problem, and I addressed that by taking this and taking the steel and transforming it into equivalent wood plates. I could do the same thing by taking the wood and transforming it into equivalent steel. You could do that as well. There's nothing to say you can't. Um, and instead of multiplying stresses by the modular ratio, we'd have to divide by them. But in the end, it, it'll, it'll work. Um, let me get to that. Um, anybody, everybody okay with this? Any questions? Does it make sense that the steel uh, for this uh, for this problem, that the steel plates were on the top and bottom. Would it make sense for the steel plates to be in the middle? No. You want the stronger material where you're seeing your larger strains and stresses. So that, that's very very common. Okay. It's why I beams are the way they are. You take a you have a um, a, a beam that's basically this this flat plate, and you reinforce it by placing two flat plates on the top and bottom. I mean, why is an I beam configured the way it is. Well, here's the centroid, and we want to get as much steel away from the centroid as we can. Well, the way you do that is through an eye shape. So that's why they're shaped the way they are. So. Any questions? Okay. Now, I have 
uh, a problem here. Let me see what time it is. Okay, we got we got a little bit of time to to address this. Now, I have a, a, a composite beam that that we see right here. The beam is uh, comprised of a wooden beam in the center. It's 10 inches wide, 12 inches tall. And it is uh, made composite uh, through the use of two six by half inch plates that are reinforcing it. So uh, over here on this problem, we've got a series of uh, section properties and we have a series of allowable stresses. Okay. Now what we're going to do for this problem is we're going to determine how much moment can be resisted by the wooden beam alone or by the composite section. So this, this problem's going to take us a little bit. So, so don't worry, we're, we're going to be digesting this problem uh, for a little while. Okay? Now, let me think if there's anything else I wanted to say. Oh, uh, here's what I want to say. I, I want to illustrate how effective the use of those plates can be. And that's why these two, uh, these two bullet points are the way they are. We're going to first determine the, the bending capacity of this section, assuming those plates didn't exist, that they were gone, they are vanished uh, out in the ether. Then we're going to go back and say, well, how strong is this section with those plates attached? Okay, so, so it's going to be sort of a, a two-part problem. Everybody okay with this? All right. All right, so I'll help you out with a couple things. So well, I know y'all are probably writing some stuff down. So let's let's deal with the wooden beam by itself. This is simple. So it's 10 inches wide, 12 inches tall. Um, what is its sigma allowable? That is. 1,000 PSI. We're trying to determine its maximum bending moment. How much bending moment can we safely apply to this section? Now, also, let's also keep in mind we haven't thrown the factors of safety in here yet. I mean, we could say, well, what if you had a factor of safety of 2? Well, use an allowable bending stress of 500 PSI. You know, we, we, could, we could do that, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think that's just semantics because I really want to make sure that everybody's understanding the mechanics. All right. So I want to determine the, the maximum uh, bending moment. Here's how I'm going to go about it. First off, what's the moment of inertia that we're going to use? Like, how, what, how are we going to compute that? So that's... And that's what? No a second on that? Right, so that's inches to the fourth. Now, what about C? Okay, remember, we're just looking at the I beam or the wooden beam itself. So how far is it from the center of that wood beam to the very, 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 very tippy tippy top or the very, very, very bottom? It's six inches, right? It's 12 inches tall, so it's six inches to the top or six inches to the bottom. So we'll say that that's H over 2. So that's six inches. All right? Now, we're using sigma equals MC over I, like that's our fundamental formula. Well, if I'm solving for the bending moment, I propose that M equals All right. I didn't know what that was, but I saw the truck. So if, I, if I'm solving for bending moment, I'm just going to rearrange that expression and say that M equals sigma I over C. Does everybody see how I did that? Multiply both sides by I, divide by C. So I propose that my maximum bending moment is as follows. So therefore, M max is sigma allowable times I over C. So that is a thousand psi that's 1440 inches to the fourth 
six inches. And what does that come out to be? Yep. All right. Do I have a second on the value? All right. We're going to 240,000. What are the units? It's a moment. So what, generally, what is a moment? It's a force times a distance. So what's the force? Is it kilonewtons? Is it pounds? And what's the distance or a length? Inches. So this is inch pounds. All right. Now, how do we convert that? Let, let's take it one step at a time. How would we convert that, let's say, to foot pounds? Do we multiply? Divide by 12. Remember, 240,000 inches equals how many feet? So what is that in, in feet? And if I wanted to convert that to, let's say, foot kips, how do I convert that to foot kips? Divide by 1,000, yes, yeah, so 20 foot kips. So M max is 20 foot kips. So just so we're clear, what we would do with that value is this. We would have a beam, right? Let's say it's 20, 30 foot long. It's got this much load on it. We draw the shear diagram, draw the moment diagram, and see if any of those values are larger than 20. If they are larger than 20, then that means our beam isn't good enough. It can't handle it. So we would have to either up our beam or reduce our load or do something. Like we'd have to, you know, make our beam well, 14 inches deep or, or, or what have you. Um, everybody okay with that? Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is this. I'm going to go ahead and stop a little early. This, this problem is going to take a little bit. Okay, but I will give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. By incorporating those plates, we get to a bending moment close to 70 foot kips. We're able to up the capacity of this beam quite a bit. Um, but we got to be real careful about how that works because because um, it's uh, it's a little bit a uh, little bit involved. Okay, everybody okay with this? So don't worry, we're we're gonna we'll get there. Okay, uh, we'll get there. Um, but I'm going to sort of leave it there. We've got a, 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 we've got a little bit of a, a chug to get to the composite bending section. So um, I'll just leave it here. Let's make sure we're clear on housekeeping. What are you giving me Thursday? Homework number four. You have homework number five. Do the following Thursday. And then we have our exam. And then let, just so we're clear, the only thing we have left to discuss on the exam, on exam two, is we need to finish composite beams and then we need to discuss shear stresses. And shear stresses are pretty simple. We have uh, non-composite, or, or sorry, non-symmetrical bending to discuss, but non-symmetrical bending is really simple. And I'm, it, it's so simple that I'm not even going to waste our time in class discussing it. If you go on to Blackboard, uh, this is example, what, 22? If you go to Blackboard, there's a PDF of example 23, and it's already solved for you, because you'll see what I mean. It's very plug and chuck, because um, there's really only one thing I, I want you to uh, understand with that. But between this and shear stresses, that's exam two. So I just want you to see the eye on the prize. Sound good? We'll finish this up next time. That's all I got. See you all on Thursday. Okay, hold on for once. Hold on for one sec.